Okay. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Anahita Royan. I work as a mm, consultant in the IT industry, but also independent researcher. And uh, my line of inquiry is the public history of scientific plant breeding. Uh, many of the fantastic talks we've heard today and yesterday um, revealed that studying public representations of scientific knowledge offers an opportunity for examining the various narratives that are mobilized by individuals or groups who are involved in uh, presenting that knowledge to the public. Now, in the next 20 minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about press coverage of scientific plant breeding in the United States between 1900 and 1914 to show you the interplay between the idea of scientific modification of living organisms with narratives describing the relation of human societies to nature that were circulating at the time. Now, that interplay resulted in the development of a scientific, of a specific language um, to capture something new. Now, in our case, that is scientists entering a field that was previously exclusive to farmers, horticulturists, nurserymen, and commercial breeders. So <clears throat> the period I've chosen is the progressive era. Mm, and during that time, the managing editors of local newspapers, uh, that were my main source of uh, inquiry here, they presented practical and very often sensationalized accounts of scientific knowledge. And during that decade, uh, scientific plant breeding became a popular topic because of two reasons. First of all, there was the rediscovery of Mendel's laws, and um, there also uh, appeared a scientific concept that gained um, widespread recognition among the scientific circles as well as the public. That was Hugo de Vries's theory of mutation. Now, Hugo de Vries was a Dutch botanist, uh, credited as one of the so-called rediscoverers of Mendel. Um, in 1900, he published the first volume of his mutation theory, following 15 years of work with the evening primrose, depicted here. Uh, just shortly, um, according to de Vries, uh, new species could arise within the period of one generation through a so-called uh, incontinuous jump, the saltation, uh, that occurred in the hereditary material of uh, passed from the parent plants to the offspring, but only as long as the parent plants underwent um, the so-called mutative period, yeah. Uh, so for him, uh, mutation constituted a process of speciation. It generated elementary species characterized by sharp distinctions from parent types. Now, de Vries was convinced that mutation occurred elsewhere. He only observed it and studied it in the evening primrose. Um, the theory of mutation brought scientific plant breeding to the limelight at the time, and one of the reasons behind that is that de Vries himself was a passionate popularizer. And between 1904 and 1912, he traveled to the United States three times, and with the help of American scientific community, he was able to deliver numerous public lectures. He published two volumes that were dedicated to uh, non-scientific audiences and contributed many articles to both general interest magazines and professional ones. Now, local newspapers reported de Vries's itinerary, noting meetings with famous scientists, as well as participation in events that shaped the history of American life sciences, and in particular, the emerging discipline of genetics. For example, de Vries was present at the opening of the Station for Experimental Evolution at Cold Spring Harbor in 1904, and he was also present at the opening of the Rice Institute in Houston, Texas in 1912. De Vries himself uh, embraced the tenets of uh, Dutch progressive liberalism. He was uh, very skilled in arguing the practical value of his work, especially to non-scientific audiences, farmers, nurserymen. He did that in the Netherlands, and he was planning to do the same in the United States. He did so, and with great effect. Um, he came to the United States three times, but twice because he was invited as the instructor in the summer course uh, of in, uh, yeah, in botany at uh, UC Berkeley. So uh, in the second volume of his Berkeley lectures, he openly stated that the far-reaching agreement between science and practice is to become a basis for further development of practical breeding as well as the doctrine of evolution. Now it's interesting that he puts practical breeding before evolution, and that's something that uh, reoccurs in his work, especially uh, the works printed in the United States. Now I was able to follow the Reese's footsteps into UC Berkeley and um, discovered um, uh, records of um, correspondence at the Bancroft Library, and one letter to uh, the contemporary um, president of uh, University of California, Benjamin Wheeler, 
He wrote, I might propose to lecture during the six weeks of your summer session on the practical side of my investigations on the origin of species by mutations. I propose some such title as natural plant breeding, etc. So that focus uh, evident in, uh, in the written work that he um, published in the States and already in this initial letter as well. That focus um, was influenced by his um, teacher, uh, the German plant physiologist Julius von Sachs. Uh, Julius von Sachs employed the argument of agricultural benefit to raise the status of uh, plant physiology as an academic discipline in Germany. Uh, now that argument of agricultural benefit uh, appealed very much to uh, the American uh, professional breeders employed by at agricultural um, colleges and state experiment stations. They were looking into a way to mm, make themselves uh, more relevant to the, uh, to the American scientific landscapes and both uh, Mendel and De Vries offered that uh, entry. Now, scholars in the history of American ecology, uh, such as Sharon Kingsland, they showed that Julius von Sachs's ideas, the ideas about the potential agricultural applications of um, knowledge about plant heredity, um, they had a significant influence over American botanists, and many of them were mutationists, so the American followers of De Vries. Um, as I said, the first uh, individual who uh, employed um, a narrative to describe his work to others, that was De Vries. So he proposed um, how basic research could in fact um, serve practical means. Now the second is the group of um, the American followers uh, of the mutation theory, so the so-called mutationists. Now they employed the mutation theory for a completely different aim. They, uh, their goal was constructing their disciplinary authority. So promoting botany as a source of experimental methodology that could be productively applied to agriculture. So among the mutationists uh, that I'm talking about now is, uh, for example, Daniel T. McDougall, George Harrison uh, Schull, or Albert Blakesley. Now they, they would all in, uh, eventually and transition into the field of plant genetics. Um, I wanted to stop at this example of Daniel McDougall. He was um, at the time when De Vries uh, came to the United States, he was the director of the New York Botanical Garden, and later on he joined the Carnegie Institution uh, in Washington as the director of the Desert uh, Experiment Station in Tucson, Arizona. Now he strongly advocated De Vries' method of experimental breeding because it matched his uh, progressive research agenda and his aggressive campaign for the public recognition of botany as an experimental discipline. And that um, goal was particularly visible in, in in his uh, motto. This is the motto to the De Vries' first work in English, uh, Species and Varieties. He pr wanted to present De Vries, as I believe, as an exemplary experimental uh, biologist. Um, so the origin of species is a natural phenomenon, Lamarck. The origin of species is an object of inquiry, Darwin. And the origin of species is an object of experimental investigation. Now, this uh, particular mm, account, let's say, is um, another narrative, and that narrative was enthusiastically received by the local press. Um, I have a lengthy quote, but I believe it's worth reading because it exemplifies very well uh, how the press, um, how the American press received um, De Vries' uh, mutation theory and the practice of scientific breeding in general. So scientists since Darwin have been able to do little more than pile up accumulations of lifeless facts. De Vries, by a single stroke of genius, has vivified this great mass and put new meaning into the theory of evolution. He has accomplished what most Darwinians believed impossible. He has shown that evolution may be observed and experimented with in the same manner as any other life process. Henceforth, evolution is removed from the limits of indirect observation and speculation. That change uh, in public perceptions of botany from uh, the paradigm of natural history into the experimental mm, field, I believe perhaps to an extent it was successful. These two examples are from a local newspaper of California. Uh, the one on your left is from 1904. Uh, they both discuss De Vries's activities in Berkeley. Uh, now in the first one, here on the left side, uh, you can see the portrait of De Vries paired with an engraving. Now this engraving presents a typical naturalist on a field trip. There is the magnifying glass, uh, there is the box for specimen collection. That's a typical image. 
Now on the right hand side, two years later, uh, De Vries arrives in Berkeley again, lectures in the botanical garden, and this time his portrait is accompanied by a completely different um, artifact that is a microscope. Uh, MacDougall uh, used the mutation theory to promote scientific plant breeding, and um, among the many <laughs> Uh, examples of the coverage. Um, there is one that I think uh, is worth uh, mentioning. It was published with a suggestive subtitle, Man Able to Change Form and Color of Flowers at Will. And it reported MacDougall to honestly believe it to be, open quotation, entirely within the range of possibilities that his methods may be so extended as to enable man, the conscious organism, to control and direct the evolution of the entire organic world. Now that approach was also picked up by newspaper editors because it was a perfect match for the audiences of the progressive era. And here I have one example. Man has proved his control of vegetable life. He takes it out of the slow hands of nature and hastens its evolution from one form to another. By combination and evolution, he produces new forms at will and endows them with economic values that nature left undeveloped. Now, local newspapers that followed De Vries' journey in the United States, um, when he reached California, mm, I believe this is a very interesting moment because the examples before, uh, I combined both Californian and non-Californian newspapers, but there was something uh, particularly uh, interesting about the ways in which uh, Californian local newspapers depicted De Vries when he arrived at Berkeley. That happened twice. So what they did is that they very frequently represented De Vries in relation to another celebrated uh, person, a Californian horticulturist, um, Luther Burbank. Uh, very often De Vries and Burbank were portrayed as two sides of the same coin. And the theory of mutation would represent the theoretical aspect of what Burbank would accomplish practically in his experimental gardens. Now, in the letter collection I managed to access, um, it became clear that De Vries uh, was familiar with Burbank's work before arriving to the United States. Uh, several months before his journey, he wrote again to the president of uh, the University of California, I had the honor of exchanging some letters with Mr. Burbank and confidently hope that he will be kind enough to show me his experimental gardens. They are for me one of the greatest attractions of California. By placing together figures these two figures, Luther Burbank and Hugo de Vries, local newspapers unveiled that the practice of scientific breeding was in fact a part of the rising industrial agriculture that stood in stark contrast to this traditional pastoral image of farming that was part of the American agrarian culture. Now the general enthusiasm that accompanied the rise of industrial agriculture as a token of progress it coincided with public expositions of scientific breeding that described its products as artificial, seeking in a way, in, in an eco-critical way, I suppose, to maintain the boundary dividing traditional agriculture and industrial agriculture, civilization and some kind of tr traditional variant of civilization, and especially that industrial agriculture that was now infused with scientific expertise. At the time of De Vries' first visit to California, uh, a local newspaper called the San Francisco Examiner ran a feature in its popular Sunday edition exploring the latest freaks in fruit. And here I have a list of uh, such freaks. So for example, Burbank's uh, white blackberries, uh, the potato tomato, monogrammed apples, and perpendicular tomatoes. So the press really revealed in, um, in a very sensational manner too in, in displaying such uh, such examples, and, uh, and, and here is a um, combination of a few clippings. Now the one uh, on the upper left side is uh, a favorite of mine. Uh, it reads, good housewives, look who's here. Melon born of cucumber and lemon astonishes the vegetable kingdom. Stenographers at the capital taste nature fake, um, they say. <laughs> You'll probably notice the, the word nature fake and nature fakers, and this is the Next part, um, uh, the next part of this, uh, of this particular depiction, uh, nature fakers is a term that circulated in the early 
yeah, in the first half of the um, first decade of the 20th century, um, the nature of Acre's controversy was a literary debate between the proponents and opponents of uh, sentimental depictions of nature. Um, at the beginning of the century, there appeared several works that, which depicted animal characters in a sympathetic way. Uh, there appeared uh, criticism of it. Theodore Roosevelt uh, also participated in the so-called nature fakers controversy, arguing that um, such depictions have no, mm, no ground in uh, the actual observations of animal behaviors. Uh, and one uh, particular uh, writer used that nature fakers debate to discuss scientific plant breeding, and he situated scientific plant breeding in it and argued how certain eminent scientists have been earnestly faking not mere words but live things, producing strange animals and queer plants that grow not as did the parent on one side or the other, but in the form of an original hybrid. Now next to it, I decided to place another rather extreme reaction. This time, uh, it's a, one of the few, there are at least a few episodes in, Burbank's, in Luther Burbank's biography that, um, that describe uh, certain um, accounts of criticism. Let's say, and this time, uh, he was accused of interrupting the well-ordered course of plant life, destroying forces and functions long established and sacred, and reducing the vegetable life to a condition at once unnatural and abnormal. Now, this one example is, of course, extreme, but in general, uh, the editors of local newspapers drew on such sentiments while presenting their sensationalized um, representations of scientific plant breeding. Um, and I suppose uh, one way to read this from an uh, eco-critical uh, viewpoint is that um, Scientific plant breeding, uh, by introducing science to that field that was previously exclusive to uh, farmers and horticulturists, nurserymen, it would disrupt the conventional boundary uh, between nature and civilization because it uh, would modify the natural to an unprecedented de degree. Um, and while speaking of California, of course, it's impossible not to, uh, not to mention uh, John Muir's environmentalist thought. Uh, it's not an accident that uh, the touchstones of the American envir environmentalism uh, derive from California, where it was a state where the gold rush and the, ag the growing industrialized agriculture, the so-called agribusiness, they, t they had taken a great toll on the environment. And that was noticed by, uh, by both uh, scientists as well as um, environmentalists such as John Muir. Now, John Muir he functioned uh, in the, I mean, the uh, he definitely belonged to the circles where, to which scient where scientists appeared as well. So for example, he was an admirer and uh, a close friend of Luther Burbank. And um, the two, they, they were also part of the Sierra Club. And I believe, uh, yes, I think Luther Burbank was the honorary member. Uh, Stanford's uh, president, David Starr Jordan, was part of that group as well. So. Um, we can definitely say that John Muir's environmentalist ideas had been relevant at the time. Uh, by, co by comparing newspaper clippings and the letters uh, De Vries wrote to his family from the United States, I was able to um, uh, confirm that uh, he was present at one of the excursions organized by the Semperverance Club, so the club uh, of John Muir. So it's, I haven't been able to confirm that for sure, but I believe that the two have met. Tracing the history of agricultural experimental stations, historians of science and technology offered numerous accounts of how scientific knowledge entangled with the widespread shift in agricultural practices that eventually fueled the rising industrial agriculture model during the progressive era. Now the process of governmental expansion over the American agriculture that was initiated in, during the last quarter of the 19th century allowed for the introduction of scientific methodologies into a field that was previously exclusive to farmers and horticulturists, nurserymen, commercial breeders, people like Luther Burbank. Now the press represented that entry of scientific knowledge into agriculture in a sensationalized manner as a novelty. Uh, and they did so, I believe, in reference to that pastoral narrative of nature that fueled the national 
culture of farming, the demise of the family farm and the introduction of industrialized agriculture. Now, the different views of natural environment presented by different groups at the time, so the mutationists, the environmentalists, and other scientists that uh, believed it would be possible to modify nature uh, with the prospect of practical uses in agriculture, they led the local press to articulate the descriptions of modified organisms that captured that conflict between nature and artifice, and a conflict that would later reappear in the media representations of genetically modified organisms as the century came to a close. <laughs>